Mr. Gordon. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 034, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Olson of Texas. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, one of the strengths of our bill is that it seeks to maximize development of current investments in technology, including the Orion crew capsule and the Ares-1 launch vehicle. Unrecognized in our bill is the great progress being made in the spacesuit technology as well. The process of producing a new spacesuit in accordance with strict NASA oversight for safety and compatibility is well underway. My amendment would recognize those efforts in space, de space suit development and life support technology by including them in the restructured exploration program. I ask my colleagues to support the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Olson, for a good amendment. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I rise in strong support of his amendment with some minor clarification into Section 202, the Restructured Exploration Program, and simply directs NASA to include spacesuit development and related life support technology among the systems it should attempt to bring forward to the new Restructured Exploration Program. Section 202 calls out Ares-1 and the Orion crew vehicle. This amendment simply adds another of the constellation-related technologies to be applied to the new crew transportation system. There's no additional cost. There's no cost associated with this amendment. It's a good provision. I urge all members to support it. If there's no further discussion, the vote is on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida. Ms. Cosmas, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will, will report the amendment. <laughs> amendment number 041, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the continued and expedited development of NASA-led heavy lift vehicle is critical to us for maintaining America's international leadership in space exploration. And I think uh, it's safe to say the opinion of the members of this committee, it's also integral to, to this particular piece of legislation. What my amendment does is to support and hasten that development by utilizing the investments we've already made by both the Air Force and other government entities, as well as by increasing the competition to ensure that the use of NASA funding is as efficient and effective as possible. As currently written, the bill before us blocks out the use of many technologies in which the federal government has already invested. This amendment would allow NASA to consider the joint use of propulsion systems across civil, military, and commercial vehicles, which would enable efficiencies in production and in cost. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment in order to ensure robust competition that will maximize federal investments in the development of a heavy lift vehicle. And I yield back my time. <coughs> Is there further discussion? Uh, let me just point out that we share the same uh, objective of getting uh, heavy lift as soon as possible. Uh, but once again, we want to do it within the resources of NASA. My, my concern is that uh, providing or this joint effort of civil uh, national security uh, commercial has never been done, at least in this area, and this thing it could slow us down. Where we have seen it uh, uh, being uh, done is in the INPOS program that wound up being an enormous waste of money. Uh, and I'm afraid demonstrated that sometimes the one-size-fit-all approach does not work. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman, since you Mr. mentioned Hall. that, let me, uh, I'm sure the gentlelady has the best intentions with this amendment, but I'm not sure to understand what she's trying to do. Uh, we want NASA to move forward with their design and development work. Uh, I guess I'd have to ask the gentlelady to explain what she's trying to either promote or restrict. Uh, and would she expect NASA to delay its design and development work until NASA completes a study on the joint use of propulsion systems with the Air Force, commercial cargo carriers, and others before they could proceed with vehicle design? NASA studied the exploration uh, architecture for uh, years. Uh, I just worry that this amendment could be an unnecessary step. Would you care to comment, Ms. Cosmos? Uh, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, to the contrary, what this is intended to do is take advantage of the kinds of innovation that have already been developed and are being used uh, by both the Air Force and other government entities and to ensure that there's a robust competition in order to uh, uh, support and hasten and expedite the development uh, by using those uh, th 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 technologies that have already been developed and are being developed for uh, other federal agencies. Well, you, I haven't seen the amendment. I should have looked at it before asking a question, but do you have the word shall in there? Mm. Where's my staff? <laughs> Sorry. What did you say? It's what? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it does. It says the administrator shall take appropriate actions to ensure the long-term affordability and sustainability of the heavy lift launch vehicle, including consideration <coughs> of joint use of propulsion systems across civil, national security, and commercial vehicles. And, and would you expect NASA to delay its design and development work until NASA completes uh, uh, a study on the use of propulsion systems with that, the Air that, Force or that, car cargo carriers? Or that certainly wasn't my intention. My intention was for them to assess what's already being done out there and to uh, ensure that there is competition in the procurement process that takes advantage of those things that are being developed or have already been developed by other federal agencies. I thank you. I withdraw my problems with it. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If no, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. Um, let's have a, sh I guess we need a show of hands. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. Those opposed, raise your hand. Uh, the no's have it. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Um, the next amendment, well, first let me say this. I have noticed that Mrs. Jackson Lee has been in our audience uh, for much of the day. She is a former member of this committee, a value member of this committee, and a member of the Aviation and Space uh, Subcommittee, and we uh, she's not able to directly participate because of the rules of the House that she's no longer on our committee, but has been a great resource as we've put the bill together, and we thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee, and hope to have your continued advice. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson. He is not here now. He just came to tell me that he is in his other committee uh, at, at a point where he is asking questions. Mr. Hall and I talked earlier uh, about not wanting to encourage people to have to wait to the end, but, but we all know we serve on more than one committee. And so if we come to a point where somebody, uh, amendment is, is, uh, is, uh, is appropriate, but they're not here, then with joint agreement with Mr. Hall and I, they'll be able to um, bring that amendment forward at the end of the proceedings. So we will pass on Mr. Grayson at this time. <coughs> and, um, Unless, some, I should say, unless someone wants to introduce it for him or anybody, okay. If not, then the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady uh, or gentleman from Ohio, uh, Mr. Wilson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 034, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Wilson of Ohio and Ms. Fudge of Ohio. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection, so ordered. Recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The authorization legislation before the committee today seeks to reaffirm our commitment to NASA, as well as ensure that America remains the world's leader in space and aeronautics. As a proud Blue Dog member of Congress, it is a priority of mine to ensure that NASA makes full use of its vast existing resources and the path forward outlined in this mark restructures our exploration program in a fiscally responsible manner. Many NASA facilities have recently been updated to reflect the testing demands of the missions outlined within the, this mark. 
Furthermore, this mark includes substantial funding to renovate existing facilities. It is the intent of my amendment to ensure that NASA utilize existing resources, either in their current or renovated form, and ensure that duplicative, yeah, it's hard to say, duplicative uh, testing facilities are not built. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Fudge, would you like to, uh, or if, if there's, is there any further um, discussion? Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson is, is recognized again. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to withdraw my motion. Thank you, um, Mr. Wilson, and thank you for bringing that information to our attention. Uh, the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 043, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment seeks to provide guidance and authority for the use of funds as proposed by the President to upgrade the Kennedy Space Center to create a 21st century launch complex capable of more efficient and more versatile operations for NASA, commercial, and military users. Many of the facilities at te and technologies at KSC and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station are literally vintage. For, in for instance, while we all have GPS on our Blackberries, the Eastern Range still operates using radar. There are many long overdue upgrades that are necessary to support NASA's next vehicle and to enable multiple users, such as the military, suborbital vehicles, and commercial launches. Expanding the capabilities on the Space Coast will leverage existing infrastructure and expertise and will allow for more effective and flexible operations. The modernization and utilization of KSC's workforce, facilities, and infrastructure by other users could lessen the negative impacts of the gap between the end of the shuttle program and the initiation of exploration activities. Additionally, the success of commercial space and eventual NASA vehicle will help to ensure that the maintenance of, uh, of our unique workforce continues. As you know, it's one of my highest priorities. But to enable this, we must bring KSC into the 21st century. Therefore, I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back my time. Mr. Hall's right Mr. Chairman, uh, supports the gentlelady's amendment. It, it just directs NASA administrator to carry out a program preparing the infrastructure at the Kennedy Space Center needed to support the exploration program authorized by this very bill. It also requires the administrator to provide a report to Congress within 180 days with an implementation plan. And the amendment also directs NASA to do a study on an implementation plan to meet goals established under the 21st Century Space Launch uh, Complex Initiative. No direction is given to implement the plan. Rather, it calls for a report describing the initiative needed to meet the goals, a description of joint initiatives with the U.S. Air Force and a timetable. I think this amendment is very worthwhile. I urge members to support it. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I, I, I certainly agree. Um, uh, this is an excellent amendment. Um, there is a unique workforce uh, in that area. Uh, they are under a lot of stress now. Uh, I think this is, a, is an excellent amendment to help really maintain that workforce uh, for uh, NASA and our country. Is there further discussion? If there's no further discussion on the amendment, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Peters, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Oh, well, Mr. Peters was here, but I guess he... So we will treat Mr. Peters as, as we mentioned earlier um, and move now to... Um, let's see... Our 16. So the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmos. Are you ready to proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 038, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmos of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. Thank Re you, Mr. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, I think we all agree that the extension of the life of the International Space Station through 2020 is a very important initiative and uh, it serves to maximize the $100 billion investment already made in the International Space Station. However, it's extremely important that we determine what parts and what components we might need to deliver to the International Space Station, especially in the case of large, heavy replacement systems and structures. This is to ensure that the promise to extend the International Space Station to 2020 is not just an empty gesture. It is important to remember that to this point, decisions about which instruments and equipment were delivered to the ISS were based on the assumption of the need to support the space station only through 2015, not through 2020. Right now, we have no answers as to how we will get the equipment necessary to extend the life of the International Space Station without the shuttle. This amendment would direct the administrator to review and report to Congress on the components needed to fully service and support the extension of the space station. Right now, 10 shuttle flights worth of flight-ready payloads, averaging between 40 and 50,000 pounds per flight, are sitting in storage warehouses, ready to fly and ready to use, over 1,400 parts and pieces of equipment. We don't know how many or which of those grounded payload items might actually be needed in order to ensure the station can be supported and maintained until 2020. Not only that, we do not know which or how many of these items are simply too large or too heavy to be carried to orbit by any existing vehicle other than the space shuttle. And finally, we do not know what additional items might need to be ordered, manufactured, and delivered in the future, or what launch vehicle capacity will be needed to deliver them to the station. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment and require NASA to quickly report back on what additional resources and equipment are needed to fully utilize the International Space Station through 2020 on how to deliver this equipment to the space station. I urge your support and I yield back my time. Mr. Hall is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I originally opposed this amendment because it contained an unfunded provision to keep shuttle contracts open for the entire fiscal year 2011. But since the gentlelady has removed that provision, I think it'd be helpful for NASA to thoroughly review the needs of the space station and report back to us. I support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I agree this is a common sense, constructive amendment that will help uh, make NASA more efficient. Uh, and I agree. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If there's no further discussion, the motion uh, uh, occurs, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment uh, on the roster, number 17, is offered by the gentlelady from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Mr. Chairman, I'm withdrawing that amendment. Thank you, Ms. Edwards, and thank you for the input uh, and the information. Um, mm -hmm. The next amendment is number 18. It's offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Um, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 039, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Hey. Mr. Chairman, I, I hope the members on both sides of the aisle listen to this argument very carefully. The adoption of this amendment is essential if this bill is to work, because if we do not give a preference to either U.S. government-funded or U.S. private sector-funded uh, launch capability, the agreements that NASA may have in mind with the Russians will simply allow the Russians to underbid our private sector launch capability and we will probably end up outsourcing more of our launch capability to the Russians. Uh, they don't have to establish a market price for their launch capability, and we will continue going down a road that was started over 15 years ago during the reign of Administrator Dan Golden, uh, where much of our aerospace uh, uh, capabilities uh, ended up not being funded because we had to fund the Russians to keep the International Space Station going. Now, I believe that we need a public and private partnership. And uh, during my chairmanship of the committee, uh, former Congressman and Chairman Bob Walker's 
uh, commercial space bill was passed and signed into law by President Clinton. We need to avoid duplication of costs, but we also have to recognize that the 800-pound gorilla out there that does not have to uh, charge for their services and the market-based price is Russia. And uh, as a result, without this amendment giving preference to launch capability made in the USA, either by the government or by American-based private sector companies, we simply will not be able to compete. And all this amendment does is it says that if there is a capability on the part of American public sector or private contractors, they shall be given preference. And this is the only way that the loan guarantees that are contained in this bill will end up working. It's the only way that we will be able to develop a viable and healthy private launch capability, not using government funds, but uh, uh, using the inventiveness of the private sector. Uh, I think you could call this amendment the prevention of outsourcing a launch capability uh, to Russia and perhaps in the future to China, and I would strongly urge its adoption. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Um, Sensenbrenner, for that constructive amendment. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Hall is recognized. This is almost a Buy America deal. I, I support the gentleman's amendment. It's sensible that we first promote and encourage our own United States companies, the very capable companies, uh, and capabilities before relying on foreign partners. I urge its passage. I agree it's a sensible Sensenbrenner amendment. If there's no further discussion, then all uh, in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is passed. And the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 042, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, you and the other committee members are aware of the fact that I have worked very hard uh, and I've articulated many times today that we are seeking solutions that minimize the human space flight gap. This is important not only to our workforce, but to maintaining Americans' leadership in human space exploration. And as I often say, maintaining that ability to inspire the next generation uh, to engage in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that, that inspiration has uh, served us well for the last 50 years, and I think we'll continue to do so. Last year, I succeeded in eliminating the hard de deadline for the shuttle retirement in order to ensure that all scheduled missions were flown. I've also been pushing to officially manifest what is currently designated STA-335, the Launch on Need mission. Providing for the launch of this mission, which will have already been processed and ready to go in support of STS-134, will have several benefits which I believe are essential and a worthwhile investment. As I said, this mission will help to minimize the spaceflight gap by stretching out the human spaceflight capabilities into mid-2011. This will ease the transition for the unique and highly skilled professional workforce, not just at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, but across the country. Many have expressed concerns about the difficult time we would have in reestablishing this valuable and cr critical workforce should it be disbanded. Maintaining a large portion of the workforce and the infrastructure into 2011 will provide a better transition and will allow us to be preparing for the follow-on program which NASA will be working to define during this period. This launch on need flight will also help to ensure that the International Space Station is both serviced and utilized to its best potential. The extended life of the International Space Station enables us to fulfill our need to explore by serving as a test bed for exploration technology development, and it will help us to address the needs here on Earth through physical and life sciences research. But we can only ensure its viability for a longer lifetime by using the shuttle our only domestic capability to deliver large spare parts and replacement hardware that were cut from the manifest when the decision was made to arbitrarily cancel the shuttle program in 2010. A list of the hardware which is fully built and stored at Kennedy Space Center is uh, 
not attached, but here in my hands for your uh, consideration. This additional launch provides the most risk-free logistical support in the next year. We should take this critical step to maximize the $100 billion investment given the recent decision to extend the life of the International Space Station to 2020. I urge you to support my amendment and to authorize this critical shuttle mission in order to preserve our workforce and maximize the investments we've made in the International Space Station, and I yield back. Ms. Cosmos, let me uh, thank you very much. Uh, you have stated very well the need uh, for this um, uh, uh, launch on need shuttle mission. It provides us a great deal of extra flexibility um, and, uh, again, uh, helps to uh, maintain the, uh, the good workforce that is in your area. Is there further discussion on this? If not, then all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Okay, Mr. Peters, um, we um, mentioned earlier that if someone is not there uh, when their amendment comes, that we will take in consideration that we all have a variety of different uh, committees to attend. Yours was just a couple before, and so we want to move back to your amendment. If there's no objection, and let's see, what amendment is that? Okay, uh, does the gentleman have, Mr. Mr. Peters, are you prepared to proceed? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 050, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Peters of Michigan. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, we uh, pursue human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit, uh, the safety and the well-being of our astronauts uh, is, of course, uh, paramount to all of us. Um. However, I also remain concerned uh, about the research recently proposed by NASA that seeks to determine the effects of deep space radiation in humans using a research method that has not been employed uh, in decades, radiation testing on non-human primates. NASA already possesses the results of 40 years of radiation experiments performed on non-human primates by NASA, the Air Force, and other military agencies. And I have concerns that additional federal funding of this research is duplicative inhumane and will not yield significantly new results to advance the safety of our astronauts. Primates, and specifically the squirrel monkeys proposed for this research, differ significantly from humans in psychological and genetic traits, and the proposed studies on monkeys employ single doses of heavy ionizing, uh, ionizing uh, radiation, which may not effectively replicate the multiple doses and mix of radiation exposures that humans will encounter uh, when they're in deep space. Uh, certainly one of the best parts of NASA's uh, space exploration program is the way it has driven our technology forward, uh, bringing us great innovations like uh, microprocessors, uh, Velcro, and microwaves. Uh, we should also strive for equal technological advances in accompanying program, research programs instead of using technologies and methodologies that are over 40 years uh, old. Historical and ongoing studies included those funded by NASA and the Department of Energy already use validated non-animal methods to determine the effects of radiation on human tissues. These include vitro studies, computational science, space radiation modeling, exposure data, and decades of follow-up on space programs. The European Space Agency has already rejected the use of primates in research experiments, and NASA aerospace engineer April Evans resigned her position on the International Space Station program in protest of this testing, calling it a step backward for NASA animal testing uh, record. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, an amendment uh, before you. I've uh, had some discussions, Mr. Chairman, with uh, some other members of the committee that uh, had some concerns, and I do have a modification. Is it appropriate to talk about the modification at this time? Well, Mr. Peters, since we have that modification and everyone hasn't had a chance to see it, th there, that needs to be uh, copied, distributed to everyone, and so with unanimous, without, without, um, with unanimous consent, I, I will ask you to uh, temporarily withdraw your amendment until it can be uh, uh, shown to everyone, and then uh, we will bring you back up at a later date. That's fine. Thank you. With no objection, uh, so ordered. And now we'll move on to the, the next amendment on the roster, which is the gentleman from Texas, Ms. Mr. Olson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? 
I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 031, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Olson of Texas. I ask, did the clerk report the amendment? Okay, yes, I ask unanimous consent to dispense the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The, I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, this amendment has already been discussed during the previous uh, amendment from my colleague from Florida, and so I'll be very brief. I strongly support the exploration space operations budget, and as such, wanted to offer alter me alternative methods of paying for the launch on need flight. I support the launch on need flight if it's necessary, safe, and paid for. For example, I'm frustrated that funds continue to be budgeted for post-shuttle workforce transition from within NASA's own budget. Their workforce transition funds in other departments, the Department of Commerce, for example, and unspent stimulus funds that should be made available to assist the workforce. Forcing NASA to use their scarce financial resources this way seems counterintuitive to me. But I will withdraw my amendment, realizing that this issue has already been voted on. And I just want to offer an alternative path to ensure we have a viable, fiscally responsible plan to execute a launch on need flight if necessary. I'll withdraw my amendment, yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Olson, and thank you for your continued constructive role you're playing in this important bill. Uh, the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Wu. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 051, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Wu of Oregon. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment makes a very simple but very important improvement uh, to the bill, and it uh, directs NASA to take into account geographic diversity uh, when uh, competing out where to locate retired space shuttles. Uh, the space program is a truly national treasure that belongs to each and every American. I believe that the process for selecting locations for the retired shuttle fleet uh, should uh, reflect this national interest uh, in space and in our space shuttle. The shuttle has played a central role in our nation's aerospace history. And I know that uh, there are deserving institutions across the country that have expressed strong interest in having uh, one of these uh, unique uh, vehicles. I think that it is very, very important that NASA's selection process be an even, even playing field for all institutions hoping to host a retired shuttle. Uh, my amendment is aimed at uh, bringing the underlying bill closer to achieving that ideal. Mr. Chairman, I want to stress that um, although some parts of the country uh, do not uh, have a substantial uh, space, uh, direct space connection, and do not uh, uh, have personnel there or facilities there, that the support for our space program comes from the taxpayers of this country uh, across the country, uh, regardless of whether these facilities exist, and that uh, the, a fair competition uh, for these vehicles, uh, even without winning the award, but, even, but just a fair competition, maintains that interest, maintains that support for American human spaceflight, and, and I think that that is absolutely crucial uh, in this day and age of uh, constrained resources and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Hall is recognized. Uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. It directs NASA to consider, quote, geographic diversity, unquote, among other considerations as it seeks to find permanent homes for the retired Arbiter fleet. Uh, this is a subject that's really discussed a lot, uh, has been within this committee and on the streets. Uh, I agree with his premise that the Arbiters needed to be located among different regions of the country to give our citizens some ease of access to visit these very marvelous machines. East Texas, West Texas, Northeast Texas, even the, <laughs> even the fourth district of Texas, even the Panhandle would make excellent homes for the Arbiter fleet. 
I believe his amendment makes good sense, and I urge members to support it. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If no, all in favor of the amendment say aye. Oh, oh aye. excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. No, Ms. Cosmas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I want to uh, speak only on behalf of the workforce in the Kennedy Space Center who have processed and launched every shuttle launch uh, that has taken place and that I like to say that they have the shuttle system in their DNA as they've been doing it for literally generations and I think it it's most appropriate that one of the orbiters stay in Central Florida. Um, you can call it Central Florida, North Central Florida, West Central Florida, Kennedy Space Center, whatever uh, suits Mr. Hall is fine by me. Thank you, Mr. Cosmas. As I understand it, um, uh, this amendment would have no impact, or not, not no impact, but it would not uh, rule out that, that, that uh, likelihood. Um, is there further discussion? If no, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. And now we have the... Um, Let's see here, the 22nd amendment. The uh, next uh, and the next amendment is on the roster is offered by the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Wilson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 033, amendment to HR 5781, offered by Mr. Wilson of Ohio, Ms. Fudge of Ohio, and Mr. Wu of Oregon. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dayton, in my home state of Ohio, is known as the birthplace of aviation. I'm very proud of the contributions that some of our state heroes have made it to flight, including Wilbur and Orville Wright, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong. Given NASA Glenn's significant contributions to space flight, space flight, as well as the contributions of numerous Ohio companies, I think that Ohio strongly deserves consideration as a permanent location for one of the space shuttles once they are permanently retired. However, I'm concerned that language contained in this mark would effectively eliminate any chance Ohio has of competing for one of the space shuttles. The language included at the end of Section 223 appears to give preference to locations with an historical relationship in either the launch, flight, operations, or processing of the Space Shuttle orbiters. I believe that the inclusion of some of this language would negatively impact states such as Ohio, California, Washington, Illinois, Oregon, and New York and the supposedly competitive process to obtain a space shuttle. Either this is a competitive procedure as set in lines 17 and 18 of this mark, or it's not. And I believe that inclusion of this language would unjustly penalize Ohio and many other states in efforts to bring a retired shuttle orbiter to their state. Therefore, my amendment would remove the priority consideration language for organizations with the launch flight operations or processing roll and once again level the playing field for this competition. I think that I thank the chair and yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Mr. Hall, Chairman. Go, go ahead and recognize. Oh, oh, okay, Mr. Mr. Olson, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I um, speak in opposition to, to the amendment. Uh, I admire and respect my colleague's position, uh, Congresswoman Fudge and Congressman Wilson, uh, but I believe that striking this language is unnecessary. I don't feel that it's unreasonable to consider the efforts of over 30 years of launching, processing, and managing the shuttle program to determine the final location of an orbiter once the flights are complete. It should come as no surprise to anyone that I believe the people of Houston in particular have earned the right to house one of these orbiters, and every member of the Texas congressional delegation agrees with me. And so do the students of the Clear Creek Independent School District, the school district that serves the Johnson Space Center. Every student from kindergarten to 12th grade was invited to draw a picture or write a letter to Administrator Bolden extolling the virtues of Houston as the home for an orbiter. Would, would the gentleman yield for just a moment? Yes, sir. I, I, I see that I have a bill across the hall. I'm going to have to leave. Let me uh, just say that... Um, Reluctantly, I, I have to oppose this amendment. Uh, I think that it 
undermines a, a, a good balance that we've had in this bill. Uh, and the current language is not mandatory uh, uh, to go any place. But I think that it is, is a good balance. And, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I respectfully disagree with you. I mean, even though I grew up in the area, again, I was struck how expiration is a part of their everyday lives. These people interact with their neighbors every day. And because they are their neighbors, they're coaches. And for many, they're moms and dads. They grew up with a program that began before each one of them were born. And I'm not going to go on further because I know we can go down the line and every member can talk about the merits of an entity or a school or a museum in their district. I asked my colleagues to remember what the first word that's been said on every, every significant space mission we've had, Houston. And so with great respect for my colleagues from Ohio, I oppose this amendment. The original language does not restrict, it rewards. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The chair recognizes Ms. Fudge. I would just like to respond to the statement of the first word said it. And you're right, it was Houston, but the guy who said it's from Ohio. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Wilson. Ms. Fudge, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, too, would support uh, this amendment because it does strike certain language in the competitive considerations for the disposition of, of the decommissioned orbiter vehicles. It amends the priority consideration given to locations with an historical relationship with the launch, with flight operations or pro processing of the orbiters to allow for priority consideration for all locations with an historical relationship with the orbiters. And with all due respect to my friends from Florida and Texas, I think the rest of us would like a fair opportunity to compete. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fudge. The chair will recognize Ranking Member Hall. I thank you, and I'm willing for you to compete. I, I think under the bill, it, the language that's in the bill, you certainly would get to compete. And you quote Wilbur and Orville. <coughs> I knew both of them. <laughs> and I really believe they'd want it in East Texas. But, uh, <laughs> but to help this committee and to help us all stay together and help us try to keep down so much uh, talk on each of these amendments and so much red tape, I report to you that Wilbur and Arville's first contract with the government was one page handwritten. The tilt rotor, the tilt wing, that you know flies straight up and out. There's just the paperwork alone weighs 22,000 pounds on that. So maybe we are letting it get away from us. Uh, whether it's in East Texas, North Texas, wherever it is, I think we have a good program for it. Uh, this amendment uh, strikes a key language in the bill that's intended to give priority consideration for the disposition of the shuttle to eligible applicants who can demonstrate a historical relationship with either the launch, flight operations, or processing of the arbiters. It only makes sense that in deciding the fate of the arbiters, the NASA administrators should give special consideration to those eligible communities whose livelihoods depended on the program for decades while the shuttles are a national treasure. They hold special value for the people who built, operated, and launched them into space. These are the men and women who worked day and night to ensure that our astronauts were able to safely travel in space and assemble the incredible International Space Station. Uh, we honor them, their families, and their efforts through this uh, provision that's on the books. Uh, I join the, the chairman and urge the members to vote no on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Hall. The chair will recognize Mr. Wu. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to express how strongly I feel about this amendment. I have been a strong proponent of American human spaceflight, and that is with no connection for the constituents that I serve, other than the vision of Americans going into space, its importance for our nation as a whole, and the, and the dream that it breeds in every child in America and for a lot of adults also. Those regions that have current facilities, that have a lot of employment, that have workers who have served America well, they have been well rewarded for those efforts. Taxpayers across this entire country have paid for these efforts. The economic benefits have been concentrated in a few places. Surely the opponents of this, this amendment would not begrudge the rest of America some participation in the dream. And that is what it's about. A lot of development occurred in Huntington Beach, California. But are you going to deny Southern California a fair shot 
at having an orbiter. I don't know how much taxes New York pays, but I suspect that it's substantial. And I think that denying folks in New York an opportunity to have an orbiter is unconscionable. Now, I admit that the chances of having an orbiter in Portland or Seattle or in Oregon are maybe a little bit slight, but I think my constituents would like to believe that they have a fair shot at this because they were denied an opportunity to work on the shuttle in the first place. This is a travesty. This is an absolute travesty. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Wu. The, ch you the chair will, will recognize Mr. Rohrbacher. Well, let me identify myself with that last outburst. <laughs> uh, if the gentleman would yield. I certainly will. <laughs> I've learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just note that uh, uh, California did play a major role in the development of the orbiter and, and the space shuttle. I remember when I was a young reporter, uh, one of the first stories I covered was going to Downey where they had the very first mock-up of the shuttle. And there it was right there in so the heart of Southern California. I walked into this big facility and there it was. And John, what it was, Senator John Tunney was having a press conference to announce his support uh, of the shuttle program. And uh, as my colleague noted, uh, many of the components, not only was it Southern California, but to my hometown as well, Huntington Beach, very much involved with developing the technologies and parts of the shuttle. And uh, for us to be, uh, uh, you know, say, fenced off from having uh, this honor of, of, of hosting uh, what was left of this program, I mean, I, it is unconscionable. And I, I think that all states, uh, should have a say in this. All, as, as my colleague stated, all the taxpayers uh, participated in financing this. And I know that the people in California, a lot of people in California had played a role in actually building it and developing the technology. So I would be very much in favor of this amendment because I think it is fair to everybody and certainly uh, uh, is, it's unseemly to have uh, certain states say, no, we're going we're gonna to have the, the leverage on saying we're who gets some of the credit or who gets to uh, show their children uh, that this shuttle uh, uh, now that now that the program's over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warbacher. The chair will recognize Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much. I, I do not agree with the outburst. I recognize the sincere emotion, but I want to say that the space exploration has been some of the most important and productive research for this nation, every single living human being has gained from it. People moved from all over the country in various places where all of this work was going on. All of it didn't go in the same place. So I don't know why we're doing all this talking about where these unused pieces of metal will be. We all can read. We all know that we all had a hand in the development, and I think it's an unnecessary waste of time to be fussing over this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Is there any further, further discussion? Madam Chairwoman, one final comment, please. Y yes. Thank you, Madam yeah, Chairman. Actually, I just no, want to. No, actually, um, yeah, Mr. Smith, would you consider yielding to Mr. Olson? No, we're going to. Yeah, Mr. Neugebrauer. Uh, thank you, Madam. Chair, I will yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues from Texas, Madam Chairwoman. I just want to point, I re again, I really appreciate my colleagues' comments and opposition to it, and I don't want to be something where we're not, we're not uh, being fair to other states. And I don't think that that's the case with the language that launch flight operations and processing should be considered. I also ask you to consider um, the value of the shuttle being at a place like we have at Space Center Houston. Because you can see the entire history of human spaceflight right there. I mean, you can get it, you can take children, your grandchildren to the facility. You can see the Mercury Redstone. You can see the Gemini, uh, the Gemini rocket. You can see a Saturn V in a hangar, an unbelievable sight. And to have a space shuttle there complementing that, it gives, it gives the American public uh, just a complete appreciation for how far We've come in human spaceflight. You see that little tiny Mercury rocket 
and realized that we actually flew our first astronauts in space on that thing and what we evolved to with the shuttle. I mean, again, I, you can't underestimate that. And uh, there is going to be a competition. We're just asking for consideration for what uh, the Johnson Center, the Kennedy Center, the Marshall Center, all the centers, California as well, what they've done. But uh, I think it's important that you look at it in the big context. It really is something that matters to the American people. We can give the, our youth a real understanding of how far we've come, and they can feel the pride we felt on July 20th, 1969, when the man who testified here a couple of months ago, Neil Armstrong, put that foot on the moon and said, one small step for man, giant leap for mankind, and I know where he was from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Madam Chair, Chair I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The show recognizes Mr. Baird. I want to associate myself with remarks of Mr. Wu. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk in this institution about the need to do away with earmarks. The idea being that earmarks somehow prejudice spending in one direction or another and uh, unduly restrict competition in favor of powerful individuals, be they in the House or Senate. This uh, language as it currently exists that would be corrected by the gentleman uh, from Oregon's amendment, uh, the, the underlying language sounds sure an awful lot like an earmark to me. And uh, I just would question how those who are opposed to earmarks can uh, uh, in good conscience support this. You know, there's a little place called Boeing up north that had a fair bit to do with the history of aviation. They've got a magnificent uh, air and space museum. Uh, it's proximal to a whole lot of Americans, and, uh, and there is a long history of flight there as well. And in contrast to the underlying language, the language Mr. Wu is offering is not an earmark. It's calling for fair competition. Uh, he's just saying we ought to have a real fair competition, not some, some very cleverly drafted language. He, Mr. Wu, to his credit, has not offered language saying it shall go to a particularly aviation museum located in a Pacific Northwest state. <laughs> he hasn't done that. He's just said, let's have a fair and objective competition. And I think that's right. And there are a host of, uh, of areas in this country. Uh, uh, and I agree with the, uh, geographical diversity. I want, my, I want my kids to be able to go home somewhere and see a space shuttle nearby. And if, if the underlying language passes, uh, instead of this amendment, I think that's going to be improbable. And, and I respect the long and proud tradition of all my colleagues who, who uh, represents districts where these were constructed. But I will tell you, with respect to the gentle lady from Texas, I don't consider the space shuttle a, a hunk of metal. When I go to the Smithsonian Institution down the street here, and I can look at the Mercury capsule and the Gemini capsule, it, it blows me away. It, take, it literally takes my breath away to think a human being got in that and went into space. And it, I was just there two weeks ago with my family who flew out uh, for the 4th of July celebration, and I took all my nephews and nieces, and we walked there, and we looked at that, and I told them the story. And I want to be able to do that at least uh, somewhat more proximal. And with that, I commend the gentleman from Oregon, urge passage of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? No further discussion? Um, the vote will occur on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 The <laughs> no's appear to have it. Ask for a recorded vote. OK. Um, the clerk will call a roll call vote. Chairman Gordon. No. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Aye. Mr. Costello votes aye. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Woolsey. <laughs> Ms. I just want to be clear. Ms. Johnson? No. Okay. Ms. Woolsey? Mr. Wu. Aye. Mr. Wu votes aye. Mr. Baird. Aye. Mr. Baird votes aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Lipinski. Aye. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Gifford votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Rothman. 
Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Chandler. Mr. Chandler votes no. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Carnahan votes aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes aye. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell votes aye. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson votes aye. Ms. Dahlkepper. Aye. Mrs. Dahlkepper votes aye. Mr. Grayson. No. Mr. Grayson votes no. Ms. Cosmas. Ms. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Aye. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Aye. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Lamar Smith votes no. Mr. Roy Barker. Mr. Roy Barker votes aye. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes no. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Lucas. Mrs. Biggert. Mrs. Biggert votes aye. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Nagabauer votes no. Mr. Inglis. Mr. McCall. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes no. Mr. Brown. Mr. Olson. <laughs> Mr. Olson votes no. Uh, Mr. Rothman is not recorded. Mr. Rothman votes aye. Is there anyone else that would like to be recorded? If not, the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have 18 members voting aye and 14 members voting no. The ayes have it. The amendment is uh, agreed to. The next amendment offered on the roster is offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 079, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, this amendment represents a continuing effort on my part to get a simple answer to a simple question, which is where are these commercial entities that seek to supplant NASA in doing launches of human beings into space, where they will be doing those launches from? Um, I asked this question of the NASA administrator a few months ago. He told me that he had been assured by every single commercial launcher that the commercial launches that they would want to do would take place from the Kennedy Space Center in Central Florida. That makes perfect sense to me. The government has invested tens of billions of dollars in developing manned space programs in Central Florida. There are thousands and thousands of people who have devoted their working lives to the manned space program in Central Florida. So I think that's the logical answer. But when I pressed to get specifics or even some sort of written confirmation of that, uh, the NASA administrator left me hanging. So this amendment is my effort to follow up on that. I see some hope, uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, this may not need to come to a vote because I'm still hoping that the NASA administrator will give me the specifics that I'm looking for. So I intend to take this up later on in the legislative process, but for now I withdraw this amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grayson. and. Uh, you had given notice earlier that you had to, uh, I think you were asking questions in your other committee. So if there is no objection, since you're here, um, uh, okay, we'll go back to your earlier um, uh, amendment. Mr. Chairman, would you refresh my time? 
Is, is the gentleman, uh, does the gentleman have an amendment at the desk? Yes. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 080, amendment to HR 5781 offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. I, I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I uh, recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we're now facing what has been referred to as the dual track, the two tracks, two different ways to go forward with manned space flight um, under NASA's wing. W one way is to continue what we've been doing for half a century, which is to have government operations launch men into space. The other is to try to develop that capability through commercial entities. I think that both are possible, both are conceivable. Only one of those is actually proven and demonstrated. But I can imagine the possibility of it happening in the future, that commercial entities will one day have that capability. What I don't understand is why we should load the dice in favor of those commercial entities. The government frequently comes across this distinction. It's in, in, in uh, the Defense Department. It's known as the make or buy decision. Do you make something or do you buy it? For 50 years now, we've been making manned space flight at NASA. And now the possibility apparently is arising that we might conceivably one day be able to buy it. That's a decision that's been made over the years in accordance with the Office of Management and Budget Circular A76, which basically says if it's better to make it, you make it. If it's better to buy it, you buy it. And that's the rule throughout the government, including the rule right now in NASA. As I read this bill, this bill would change that rule. It would put a thumb on the scale in favor of commercial entities, which frankly, don't seem to deserve it. Um, as I said before, they may or may not ever develop this capability. Why we should be biased in their favor is something I find hard to understand. But I see in four different locations in this bill, and that's exactly what's happening. For instance, if you turn to page 25, you'll see the language as follows. If one or more United States commercial entities are certified to provide ISS crew transportation and rescue services, the crew transportation system developed under this section shall be available as a backup ISS crew transportation and rescue service as needed, but shall not be utilized as the primary means of ISS crew transportation and rescue, or otherwise compete with the commercial system for ISS crew transportation and rescue services. So what this means in a nutshell, Mr. Chairman, is that as soon as any commercial entity is simply certified to provide ISS crew transportation and rescue services, then the program that has stood us so well for the past half century goes by the wayside permanently. I just don't get it. I don't understand why we'd want to do that. We've all heard the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It seems through this bill and these four provisions that I've identified, what we're really saying is if it ain't broke, throw it away. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. I'm perfectly willing to see a level playing field, a fair competition between government programming and commercial entities doing the same programming. That's fine. I don't see any harm to that. But why we would say that the minute any particular commercial entity merely is certified in order to provide ISS crew transportation rescue services, and that in itself means the demise of the government program, that I don't understand at all. I've identified three other places in the bill that also tilt the playing field in favor of the commercial entities that are entirely unproven. And again, as I said earlier today, these are entities that have no sales, they have no profit, they have very little capital, they have no experience, and in fact, they have no product. They don't even have something that would launch human beings into space at this point. And we're saying that as soon as one of them is simply made qualified, then we throw out the entire manned space program as we know it, and as we've developed it for the past half century. If you turn to page 47 of the bill, you'll see that Congress, by this bill, would be affirming the policy of making use of United States commercially provided ISS crew transportation and crew rescue services to the maximum extent practicable, which under this bill means limiting to the maximum extent practicable, the use of the system developed under Section 202, which is in fact the government alternative, to non-ISS missions once commercial crew transportation and crew rescue services that meet safety requirements become operational. I want to see a fair competition. We've been led astray many, many times by government contractors who overpromise and then don't deliver. There's not a single country in this entire world with a manned space program that does this the way that this bill dictates. 
All I want to see is a fair level playing field between whatever commercial alternatives develop and the program that has stood us so well for the past 50 years. Therefore, I respectfully ask people's support for this amendment to level the playing field. Thank you. Mr. Hall is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I oppose the gentleman's amendment. I think the existing bill uh, itself strikes a good playing ground, it strikes a very good balance between ensuring that we can meet our obligations to the nation, encouraging commercial development of our space in a measured and rational way. If commercial crew entities can deliver on their claims and do so to NASA's safety standards, there's no reason why they should not be included in NASA's mix of space transportation. This amendment takes that away. I oppose the amendment. Uh, Mr. Garamendi is, rec is recognized. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment uh, does allow for commercial human space flight, but what it does is to change the prioritizations. I think Mr. Grayson is absolutely right in what he's proposing. I also uh, asked staff a while ago a definition of a commercial company. Uh, apparently in existing law, a commercial company can in fact be a foreign owned company, that is one that has more than 50% ownership. It can also be a company that has 50% something less than 50% ownership by a foreign. The language in the current bill says United States commercial company. And I'm quite curious as to which definition applies and exactly what United States commercial company is. It seems to me that we may in fact be opening the door to commercial companies that are not majority owned in the United States and not controlled by United States interests. Uh, and therefore, not only is Mr. Grayson's amendment appropriate, but it may be even supercharged by a question of who controls the commercial company. And I would recommend the passage of his proposal. Mr. Robacher is recognized. Well, let me just uh, suggest that I, I don't agree with the fundamental uh, logic of what uh, Mr. Grayson, who I respect, is. Um, his intelligence, and I re respect that he has a point of view, but I don't think his argumentation actually is consistent. The fact is we are not loading the dice. Uh, if anything, the dice have been loaded in favor of having a government-run space transportation system. That's the way the dice have been loaded. All of the money goes through the government and through NASA uh, uh, and goes into this type of uh, uh, of government approach, and that's one of the big debates we're having. This is a, you know, Luke Skywalker versus uh, Han Solo debate here, and uh, let us. I mean, there's two fundamentally different approaches to people in space. Do we want entrepreneurs in space? Do we want businessmen in space? Do we want government employees to be the only ones who get to go into space and have these activities? We're just laying the foundation so that the commercial sector can play a role. Uh, the, we did the same thing with the railroads. Let, and let's just note, in the beginning of our country's history, there was some uh, uh, people who wanted us to build all of the American ships. The ships would be built by the government. But instead, our fa our, the people who founded our country had a very good understanding that, no, we're going to leave this transportation across that great ocean to the private sector. We thus developed in the private sector the clipper ships which became the dominant force for commerce in the whole world. And America was that playing that role, and we were the ones who did this without government uh, uh, having to approve of everything and, uh, and co-opt all of the funds that were necessary. And when we wanted to develop a railroad, yes, the government played a role. The government provided a certain amount of wealth, meaning land on either side of the track, to promote the commercial activity. I think we would have a far different country today had we decided uh, early on in our country's history simply to have the government running all the transportation systems and all the people in the transportation systems working as government employees. It'd be a different world, it'd be a different country. I think we're better off by the direction that we took. What's going on here is an attempt to ease us away from, the, from what had been 
co-opted by a total government approach to now going into a more private sector approach. And there are companies in the private sector, uh, who I disagree with Mr. Grayson, who have great track records in building spray space transportation technology. Boeing and Lockheed, you look at the Delta system and the Atlas system, these are very good systems, yes, and they were done in cooperation with government, but now let's see if we can attract, by definition, more money from the private sector into, the, into this whole uh, arena of space transportation. Uh, if we do not do that, it will be the government's job and it will be only taxpayer money. And what's, what's the problem with allowing the commercial people to come in and spend some of the money that we would otherwise be spending in the, uh, from the taxpayers? So I would oppose this amendment and I would hope that uh, we all agree that it, it, it would be a good thing to have commercial investment in space and to encourage that and that would be a boon to the taxpayers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Obaka, for number three. And Ms. Giffords is recognized. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I have to just speak in opposition, respectfully, of the amendment. When looking at the language, the bill actually does not require that the government system be shut down if a single commercial provider is qualified for launch. Rather, the provisions just allow that the commercial provider can fly to U.S. astronauts to the ISS. They actually don't prohibit NASA from developing or flying its government program. And in fact, if, if this bill had, I wouldn't support the language myself. What we're saying is that we don't want the government unfairly competing with the private sector once they satisfy all of NASA's requirements. And that said, as in the case with many other, other government make or buy decisions, the bill itself makes clear that the commercial systems can't cost more than the government provided on a seat or an, on a dollar per seat basis. And of course, as Mr. Grayson knows, OMB Circular A76 is actually not law. It's an executive branch directive. So be that as it may, um, we will not be giving an unearned and undeserved preference to commercial entities as, as was asserted in the dealer colleague um, that he circulated. They're going to have to meet all the requirements laid out in the bill before they can be considered for contracts with the federal government. And again, as we've been saying, it's that balance between government, private sector, and I, th I think this strikes a fair balance. Thank you, Ms. Giffords. So if there's no other discussion, then all in favor of the, of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. I think we have time for two more amendments. And so um, uh, the next amendment on the roster is offered by the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Fudge. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 070, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Fudge of Ohio and Mr. Wilson of Ohio. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment directs the administrator to conduct a study with the National Academies on the feasibility of a commercial space market as we have yet to see a federal study on this industry. We need to determine the market demands for commercial human spaceflight, both home and abroad. Additionally, though this is only a five-year authorization, it is crucial that we have the financial data to determine whether a commercial spaceflight sector can sustain itself for the long term. Mr. Chairman, I'm glad to, to see that you value, that you see value in conducting a study like this one described in my amendment. I look forward to working with you on the language and incorporating a commercial market study requirement before the committee brings this bill to the floor, and I withdraw my amendment at this time. Thank you, Ms. Fudge. Uh, let me just remind members, uh, we have one more amendment to go before we're going to go to vote, or maybe we might even have more. Um, if we get this bill out today, as we are going to, then I, there is a reasonable chance that maybe next week, uh, if there is a law that we could get this on the floor, uh, which uh, I think would be very beneficial for us in trying then to go to conference. So we're gonna move forward and the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Oh, excuse me, with the clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 065, <coughs> amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Matheson of Utah. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you. I'll take less than five minutes, Mr. Chairman. This amendment clarifies NASA's obligation to fulfill requirements that are in the bill. It's What my language do is simple. It requires NASA to use the money that is authorized in this bill to perform work on the program spelled out in the bill. 
the underlying bill requires NASA to come up with a spaceflight plan within 180 days of enactment of the law. In the meantime, there's nothing to prevent NASA from continuing to fund the programs that are authorized. My amendment requires NASA to continue to fund programs and not use that money at a later date for terminating these same programs. Now, this is an amendment that's a result of bipartisan discussions on both sides within this committee. Um, I appreciate the help of both the Majority and Maury staff to uh, develop this amendment. And I, it's more of a perfecting amendment than anything else in terms of the underlying bill. And I urge my colleagues on both sides to support it. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matheson. Is there further discussion on this amendment? Uh, if not, the vote is on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed no. Uh, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Robacher is up next. And since Mr. Robacher is up next, we know this might take a while. Um, so um, we will uh, take it, uh, we will adjourn at this time to come back, uh, this time uh, five minutes uh, after the last vote. Thank you.